Wasn't tacky on Croy, Prince, and Jack Braun, Captain Flint, Brain Trust, Earl Sanderson, Silver Helix, Chop Chop, Young Troll, Stopwatch, Will and Wisp, Turtle, and Xavier Desmond. Hello, and welcome to Card Table. Uh, so, uh, we're moving on to Volume 16, uh, following my, uh, my oh-so-clever uh, renumbering, resequencing, where 16 comes after 17. Uh, <laughs> we tackled Death Draws 5 last time, uh, Volume 17, so now we're on to Deuces Down, Volume 16, which I already discussed in a previous video when talking about switching those two and reading 17 first. So... 16, originally when it came out, it was uh, the first, I think the first anthology in Wild Cards to not have a, some sort of interstitial binding it together in some way. It came out from a, a new publisher after a seven-year publishing hiatus. Uh, so 1995 had been the year of Black Trump, Volume 15, and then 2002 was the year of Deuces Down. Um, it's a new publisher, and a, a little thin just in terms of quantity. Uh, you know, perfectly good stories in there, but all, only seven of them and no interstitial tying them together. It was instead tied together by this theme of deuces deuces down um, in in the wild cards universe they establish that if if aces are the, the the characters in the series who have acquired superhuman powers from the wild card virus deuces are uh characters who uh have been given an ace power but um their power is somewhat uh negligible not 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 terribly impressive um and so they're deuces it's uh, certainly, uh, you know, it's not an exact science. There's, there are a few interesting uh, essays by Ian Tregillis on the Wild Cards website uh, where he kind of talks about um, how, how scientists within the Wild Cards universe would kind of go about classifying these things because obviously um, it's, it's easy enough to say so-and-so is an ace because they got power, so-and-so is a joker because they've been in some way uh, mutated. Uh, and deuces are simply people with powers that aren't that impressive. But where do you draw the line between an impressive power and a non-impressive power? Even within deuces down, there are some that uh, that are like, well, that, that's actually pretty darn useful and impressive. So uh, even even the now even the book itself, uh, it's the these. Um, these definitions are porous, and uh, Ian Tregillis in his essays has actually talked about how um, really uh, it makes more sense to look at things uh, along along a spectrum rather than along these sort of like rigidly defined things. Uh, not unlike uh, the the way uh, current uh, gender theory has, has started to started to finally realize that things are really more of a spectrum than than these rigidly defined uh, notions of 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 A and B. Um, and nothing in between. But in a fictional universe, sometimes you just say, "All right, here's a bunch of deuces," <laughs> and that's what we're, that's what we're calling them. So that's what they are, because uh, uh, authorial fiat uh, says so. So there's seven stories in the original book, all about deuces. Um, and yeah, like I say, that that's the only theme that uh, connects them, where there is no interstitial. Then when Tor, only pretty recently, uh, just a couple years ago, finally released, uh, re-released uh, Deuces Down. Uh, it was one of the books, uh, they had done it previously with volumes 1, 4, 8, and 9, where they had added new stories to the anthologies. In the case of Deuces Down, uh, it's it's a much more drastic overhaul, rather than just kind of inserting some new some new pieces uh, in the cracks between the, the book. In this case, uh, they added an interstitial where there previously had been none, uh, and Carrie Vaughn kind of kind of uses a similar uh, tactic to what Stephen Lee did in Volume 13, uh, which I raved about recently, where there's a, uh, in, in the case of Volume 13, Card Sharks, it's a, an investigator, an arson investigator, who's sort of t kind of taking depositions, interviewing different people, uh, to try and get evidence uh, about this uh, evidence proving the existence of this card sharks conspiracy, uh, and so there's these testimonials, and so each story is set kind of in a different period of time, but not they're not in chronological order; they're just in the order that the arson investigator Hannah Davis sort of finds a particular witness and gets a story. So once one one story is maybe set in the 80s, and then the next one in the 50s, and then the next one in the 60s, and and then. Uh, and then back to the 50s or whatever. So, um, whereas the original versions, version of Deuces Down, those seven stories were just kind of in chronological order. It was kind of like, here's one sentence, 1968. 
Here's one set in 1969. Now here's one set in 1977. So this time, uh, so for the interstitial and the new version of Deuces Down, it really is a different book, vastly different book, I think, in a lot of ways, because uh, Carrie Vaughn creates a brand new lead character, a journalist. So Vaughn was kind of given carte blanche to rearrange the story so they're no longer in chronological order, much like with uh, Volume 13, Card Sharks. Now it's just sort of the order in which the lead, the new lead character of the book uh, is encountering people uh, and, and, and getting them to tell their stories. So once again, it kind of jumps around, uh, becomes very, very similar in that way to, to uh, Card Sharks, becomes very, uh, there's definitely a lot of par parallels you could find now between those two volumes, where originally uh, there, there were no such parallels. Uh, so really fascinating, uh, kind of a fascinating, um, in, in a sort of, uh, what's the right word? Kind of philosophical sense of, uh, you know, what, you know, how, how how much can you alter a novel and still have it be the same novel? Because uh, it really, or or a book and it's still the same book. Because it, I mean, I guess anthology is maybe more accurate than novel, but certainly the new version is more novelistic than the original version. Uh, you know, we're now the new version has a new lead character who literally didn't exist in the original version, which is uh, just very interesting. Like, how much can you alter a text before it's uh, and, and still call it the same text. It's just a, uh, just a, yeah, just a kind of a fascinating uh, little case study. Um, I've never really seen anything quite like it. It's very interesting. Um, meanwhile, um, there are also two just additional stories. So where there there were originally seven, there are now nine. And uh, yeah, just overall, I mean, and it's a much better book. I I I, I didn't dislike the original version of Deuces Down. But I certainly remember that thinking that after seven years, um, it, it was, it was, uh, um, <laughs> in the spectrum between whimper and bang, I would say it was uh, a little more whimperish, um, you know. But again, it's all a spectrum. It's not doesn't have to be a bang or a whimper. It could be somewhere in between, um, you know. <laughs> let's not let's not pigeonhole our bangs and our whimpers anymore. We're not doing that. It's 2023. This new edition is definitely uh, more more bang for your buck, so to speak. I think it's uh, just um, a wholly, uh, in every way, an improved reading experience. Even the original stories that were in, even those seven original stories just uh, have been sequenced a little more shrewdly. Um, I did ask uh, Carrie Vaughn on Facebook. She was kind enough to give me some background. Um, if I'm remembering right, uh, it was it was George R. R. Martin's idea to add an interstitial to the book, but it, and then when Carrie Vaughn was the one uh, who would be writing that, it was her idea to resequence the stories. Uh, and she does mention that she wanted to sequence it in such a way that Stephen Lee's story uh, promises was the climax because she really liked the the beautiful writing in that story. Uh, which part of the reason I bring that up is because it brings up an anecdote involving myself where <laughs> years ago, uh, back when the book was originally published, I had emailed Kevin Andrew Murphy uh, to tell him how much I liked his story, which in the original version of the book, his was actually the ending, the last story in the book, um, entitled With a Flourish and a Flare. So I, I corresponded a little bit with, with uh, Kevin via email and uh, probably came off as incredibly awkward. I, 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 I would shudder to look at those emails now because I'm sure I was a little starstruck since uh, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the fevered mind of a, of a wild cards enthusiast, the, the authors are all, they're, they're kind of rock stars, even though, of course, they're incredibly down to earth people in real life. And uh, they're just like you and me, unlike rock stars. So anyway, uh, so in, in those correspondences with Kevin Andrew Murphy, at one point he asked me to write a review of Deuces Down for Amazon, uh, just because there hadn't been that many and, uh, you know, algorithms and all that, the reviews help. And so uh, I, I, I guess I wanted to sound really smart in the review. And this is something that it probably is still up on Amazon. I, I, I think the reviews just stay up there, right? Uh, it's another thing I would just cringe to read now because I think I was trying to sound very smart and uh, I'm sure it comes off as terribly pretentious and awful. But anyway... Uh, Stephen Lee, of course, uh, wrote Puppet Man, who's this terribly vile villain. And in the Puppet Man stories, you get some graphic depictions of some pretty horrible things, running the gamut from you know terrible you know violent rapes to 
horrible horrible dismemberments and I don't know uh, uh, mutilations and just terrible stuff done under the sort of the the aegis of of Puppet Man's mental control uh, <laughs> and then uh, upon Puppet Man's uh, defeat in Volume Six. Uh, Stephen Lee moves on to Bloat, who uh, through whom we get a lot of graphic depictions of a pretty hideous Joker mutation involving someone kind of defecating through every pore in their huge slug-like body, and uh, you know the the waste product kind of sliding down that body and leaving you know horrible <laughs> excrement stains everywhere. Uh, so some pretty nasty stuff. And so I do remember being struck, um, much much like uh, Carrie Vaughan mentions, just struck by the, the beauty of Stephen Lee's writing in his story Promises. Even though there is a Joker in that story who, who does have some, some sort of tragic mutation, and uh, there, there's still a little bit of, of that kind of, of writing, but there's also these sort of beautiful passages just, just uh, kind of, even the ones just kind of describing the environment, because it's all set on, a, on this sort of, this... Uh, small little joker community Rathlin Island uh, an island off the coast of Ireland or, um, so it's just these loving descriptions of, of this sort of small humble Irish uh, community on this kind of picturesque island uh, in the midst of this uh, sort of beautiful ocean and it's lovingly described in some really beautiful prose and then the story itself is kind of a, a something of a love story which is certainly a departure for Lee uh, when you consider his his wild card content, I, I'm I'm not I'm not speaking to his body of work as a whole, but if you look at his wild card stories, it, uh, a, a sort of gentle Irish love story is just kind of out of character <laughs> for anyone who's been following through the first fifteen books. So I said in my Amazon review that uh, the story was um, I'm uh, going to quote as exactly as I can here, mercifully free of the grotesquerie of some of Stephen Lee's earlier work, uh, uh, his Puppet Man and Bloat work. And had those words actually uh, thrown back in my face later, years later, participating in a Wild Cards uh, uh, internet discussion group, uh, which had a couple of the authors participating, including Stephen Lee. I may have told the story in an earlier video, um, but he uh, somehow uh, there was talk about reviews and how and how critics' words can sometimes be a little, uh, you know, this or that or, or unflattering or whatever. And uh, Stephen Lee said something like, "Yeah, sometimes even the compliments can be a little harsh." And uh, and he said, one Amazon critic once said that my story in Deuces Down was mercifully free of the usual grotesquerie. Uh, yeah, quoted it word for word, and. Uh, and he was like, there's a backhanded compliment for you. And I, I read it and it's like, should I, should I say that it was me? Or, or would it, is it weirder if I say that it was me? Or is it weird that I, that I try to just pretend that it wasn't? Just be like, oh man, that Amazon reviewer sure sounds like a jerk, Stephen. I'm sorry. Uh, so I thought, no, you know, own it, own it. You know, be a man, own it. So I think I said something, you know, I posted in reply like, Stephen, I cannot tell a lie. <laughs> Yeah, it was me. <laughs> and I said, Logo, can I tell you, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a lightweight when it comes to uh, R-rated things. Even, even R-rated movies, I sometimes have to look away during a particularly gory scene. And I was like, what can I tell you? I, you know, I love Puppet Man. He's the greatest villain ever. But uh, some, of those, some of those descriptions, man, of some of the stuff that he sort of presided over telepathically... Uh, pretty harsh to read about and I was like so I'm sorry it probably I should have just complimented the story instead of having to say that previous stories were grotesque and uh and he was very Stephen Lee was very gracious in reply actually he was very um uh very kind and you know he said something like uh something to the effect of no no don't you dare apologize if that's your opinion then you know you sh you were right to state your opinion it's cool you know I'm we authors are thick-skinned, you know, it's fine. Uh, I may have been bemused by the wording, but, you know, I, my, my, my feelings can take it. It's all good. Uh, so, yeah, he was, he was incredibly gracious about it, and I always appreciated that. and always. But still, to this day, I feel sheepish when I think about it. I think it's a funny story. I'm happy to share the story at any opportunity, but I also kind of laugh because I, I sort of feel like, ah, 
what a jerk I was. So uh, I guess uh, briefly going through some of the other stories. So uh, Kevin Andrew Murphy's story is with a flourish and a flare. In my nifty reading order where 16 comes after 17, uh, Kevin Andrew Murphy's story becomes actually something of a flashback because it's set in 2001. Um, and uh, Volume 17, Death Draws 5, is set in 2000. Three. Well, it's it's about John Fortune partly, and uh, and and the the Ackroyd Detective Agency, most notably Mr. Nobody, being a kind of a bodyguard to John Fortune, uh, which is which is a very significant and important element of Death Draws Five, as I talked about last week. But it also introduces this uh, boy band called the Joker Town Boys, uh, which is five five of. Uh, Five five jokers, uh, or, or sort of six jokers, because there's kind of an unofficial sixth member uh, who's actually the protagonist of the story. Um, but they're all they're all jokers who were uh, grew up in the same orphanage. Um, although to say that all six of them are jokers is an oversimplification, as as you as you find as you if you if, if as you find once you read into the story, and there's uh, uh, some subtle things and some not so subtle things, and that you. That you kind of take away, and um, but but from the perspective of the public at large, it's a band made of made of five jokers who are sort of all kind of teen heartthrobs, to, despite their Joker mutations. And uh, yeah, just a fun story, a, a bit of a romp. It also involves Topper, the character who can pull things out of her top hat that I mentioned is visually kind of like uh, DC Comics's Zatanna character um, to some degree, or at least that's kind of how I picture her. I, I think Topper has red curly hair whereas Atana has black hair, but apart from that. And then uh, Promises, the Stephen Lee story, uh, uh, partly partly uh, is a, it, it continues a, a very minor thread from the end of Black Trump uh, involving this sort of minor, minor uh, uh, deuce character named uh, Gary Bushhorn, who's a sort of supporting character in the first part of Black Trump, who just kind of, kind of, essentially vanishes from the book once once he's played his part in the narrative. You don't necessarily miss him, uh, but it's kind of interesting that, that Stephen Lee choose to, chose to sort of follow up on him and, and say, like, what happened to him after he kind of disappeared from Black Trump? And uh, uh, and again, kind of ends up being this sort of beautiful sort of uh, love story set on this uh, Irish, in this Irish community, on this remote island. Uh, so a very nice story. Uh, I guess the video is getting kind of long, so... I always think I can do it in one video and then I get too long-winded, but uh, uh, there's still um, quite a few stories left to talk about, so I'll, I'll save that for next time. So uh, this is the end of uh, Deuces Down uh, Part 1, and uh, I'll come back next time and we'll wrap up our look at, at Volume 16. Till then. To try and give our love back some sparks. He said, we'll get your love growing. But before we get going, may I highly recommend Cod Shocks? I like to go out dancing. My baby loves a bunch of authors. Lately we've had some friction. Cause my baby's hooked on shared world fiction.